very warm welcome uh, to our, our webinar this morning on our new regulatory model. We're really pleased to have you uh, join us for the next um, hour to talk um, all things uh, new model uh, and CQC. Um, for those of you who don't know me, not, my name is Kate Taroni. I'm the Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care here um, at the CQC um, and I will um, be uh, shortly introducing my colleagues who will be uh, joining me to take uh, questions. But before we get into the content and what we're going to cover um, today, I just want to take a moment to recognise that yesterday, uh, as we're all aware, was the National Day of Reflection, uh, marking two years since we went into um, lockdown at the start of the pandemic. And as ever, when I have the opportunity to talk to a large number of people like I do uh, this morning, I just want to pause for a moment and just uh, say again a massive thank you for everything you've done and your teams have done over the last uh, two years uh, to support people in the most extraordinary, uh, difficult and challenging um, times. So I just want to, before we get into the business bit, I just wanted to recognise that yesterday was a really important day for pausing and reflecting on uh, what everyone has been through over the the last two years but also uh, sat with you today to say a massive thank you for for what you for what you've achieved and and how you supported people in these in incredibly incredibly difficult times so um on the call today uh, the format is i'm going to talk to you for for a little bit for, for the first uh, part of the webinar um but then i'm really pleased to be joined by two of my uh, deputy chief inspectors rob assel and sue howard um it's fabulous to have dave james who's our head of policy uh, join us so between myself uh, sue rob and dave we will respond to your questions uh, towards the end of the session and then we've got our team uh, making this happen. So we've got Latoya, David and Steph and a big thank you uh, to those colleagues who have got us uh, here today ready to uh, cover what we're going to cover. So that's the, that's the team. Um, the plan uh, for the session uh, this morning uh, as you know, this is a Teams live uh, chat, so uh, we will be talking. You from already are able to put your questions um, into the chat, so please do, please react as I talk, please pose um, any questions and there will be time uh, to pick them up uh, in about halfway through the session once I've finished uh, talking. Um, as you would expect, probably uh, this webinar, webinar is recorded and we will upload it onto our YouTube channel later for colleagues who haven't been able to join uh, and who would wish um, who and who would wish to hear the content. And also we will share with you the slides that we are presenting today. So no need to be scribbling uh, notes. You will get uh, you will get a copy of them um, at the end of the session. So uh, we've got an hour together and we will absolutely be finished uh, in time. But please be uh, active participants and drop your questions, your actions and your chat uh, into the chat as we go. So what are we going to cover uh, today? I'm going to do a quick recap of our CQC strategy, uh, which we launched last year. We're going to talk about what we've been focusing on in terms of our regulatory activity uh, recently and what our priorities are uh, going forward. We're then going to focus on our new regulatory model and I'm going to do a bit of a compare and contrast to the current model and our plans for our new regulatory model. Uh, we're going to get into our single assessment framework and then we will hopefully have plenty of time for questions and answers, Q&As at the end. So that's the plan uh, for the hour. OK, so if I can move on to uh, talking a bit about background, setting the scene and uh, talking a bit about our strategy. We're still calling it our new strategy, but actually we published it back in um, uh, May uh, 21. And we published it after having and really benefiting from a huge amount of engagement in what our strategy uh, should look like. So a massive thank you to probably many of you who helped shape up our strategy that we published um, in, in May last year. But it is still relatively, it still still feels relatively uh, new. So just a, a quick recap of what our, our strategy says. Um, fundamentally, we want to be a regulator who regulates through the eyes of people with lived experience. So we want our, our regulation method to be based on what matters to people. We want to have the ability to not only regulate the quality of individual care delivered by individual providers, but to comment on how people experience care through a pathway, how joined up people experience their care. So we are the kind of first pillar of our strategy is around people and communities. So how, how do people ensure that they access care in a timely way? What happens about inequalities um, and how uh, we can regulate through the eyes of people with uh, lived experience? 
The second pillar is about being a smarter regulator. No doubt um, many of you on the call will have opinions about how we uh, regulate to date. We are really keen that we continue to be uh, an, an incredibly helpful resource to the public in terms of giving them up to date, uh, helpful information about the quality of care out there. We also want to help providers improve by uh, showing what best practice looks like. Um, so to be a smarter regulator, we want to present information in a way that's more timely and we want to have a spectrum of ways, a spectrum of tools that we can use in the way that we regulate so that we can be proportionate as well and that we've got real clarity between us and between providers about what we can, uh, what we expect when we come out and, and look, uh, look at the quality of care being delivered. So um, our second pillar is around being a smarter regulator. Third pillar is around accelerating improvement. We, through our strategy discussions, had lots of conversations about what our role should be around improvement. There was um, there was quite an appetite for us to play uh, more of a role in showing what are the ingredients that enables uh, providers to deliver um, outstanding care, what are the components of Im improvement, and that's a space we're really excited to be uh, in more. And then the final pillar is around our, uh, our role around uh, driving uh, safety through learning. Uh, so those are the four pillars of our strategy underpinned by uh, a willingness to uh, wanting, wanting to look at issues around inequalities and our new roles around uh, assuring systems that we will uh, talk about a bit as we um, go. OK, if we can move on to the next slide, uh, please, Steph. So a little recap, I won't talk much about um, uh, everything we've done since the start of the pandemic, but um, just want to take this opportunity to remind people uh, that we uh, we have never stopped regulating through the pandemic. From the from the beginning of the pandemic, we uh, talked about pausing routine inspections, but we have continued to do risk based inspections. Um, you may remember back in the summer of the uh, of 2020, we developed our new infection prevention control methodology. Uh, so we've continued to do risk based inspections and have a real focus on how providers are effectively delivering delivering IPC. So since the start of the pandemic, we've done 13,000 um, inspections. Um, since December, this December uh, just gone, uh, we've done 2,711, uh, with 2,000, a little over 2,000 of them being uh, around infection prevention control. Um, it would be worth uh, a little reminder uh, to this group. Um, we have broadly been assured across all the eight ticks of assurance when it comes to IPC. The only area that needs continual vigilant focus is around um, making sure providers have the most up to date policies around how they deliver effective IPC. So of the areas of assurance that falls down, uh, we've noted uh, in recent months it's the issue around policy. So just a little plug um, for that. And just the final comment on what we've seen with our IPC inspections. Um, you'll probably be aware that a component of IPC inspections is looking at how providers are, are supporting people to have um, visits. So I'm talking particularly at the moment to um, care home providers. I think uh, all of us are acutely aware of the impact over the last two years where um, providers have had the incredibly difficult job of weighing up keeping care home residents physically safe um, while also maintaining their mental well-being through contact uh, with loved ones. It's been a really difficult balance to strike. Um, throughout it, we've asked providers to follow government guidelines. Uh, we've said that blanket bans were unacceptable and would probably trigger an inspection um, and we have looked at every concern that has come to us around visiting. Um, uh, we've looked at visiting on our inspections uh, uh, over uh, the last few months since December in particular and in 97% of those 2000 inspections we were assured on visiting. So it's been a tough job. Uh, broadly providers have been uh, getting that balance right but we continue to look very closely uh, around visiting because of the significant impact it's had on uh, residents uh, mental well-being also. So that's a little bit about what we've done. If we can turn to the next slide, which is our focus going forward um, from March. So I um, haven't seen your questions yet, but I anticipate there will be questions around 
um, when are you going to come back out and rate us? Um, we know that it is incredibly important for particularly adult social care providers to have up to date ratings. We know that the public really use our ratings to make decisions about where they want to receive their care from. Uh, we know a, 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 a less than good rating impacts on staff morale and the massive challenges we have in the sector around recruitment and retention. And then there's also finally that kind of commercial challenge of having a less than good rating and, and what that means for your business and, and stability, etc. So we are really keen to get back out and start re-rating um, wherever we can. So our priorities from this month going forward, as you ex would expect, uh, absolutely continue to be about responding to risk and we will always flex that as our priority. So the amount of inspection activity and our areas of focus will always be number one, responding to risk and ensuring people uh, remain safe. Um, however, wherever we can, we want to re-rate. So we know we can re-rate through our focus inspections and we know our direction of travel, which I'll talk about shortly, is about uh, producing reports that are succinct and that get to the point. Um, so we will be doing focus inspections and we will be re-rating re uh, wherever we possibly can. Um, we will be going back to inadequate and requires improvement uh, services. We will be going back to some good and outstanding services, um, uh, A, for all the reasons I've set out, but also our, our inspectors are desperately keen to uh, get some balance back where um, I know nothing gets my uh, inspectors more excited than going out and seeing outstanding practice. So uh, they want it, you want it, but also we want to make sure we can support the improvement agenda by showing what best practice uh, looks like. Um, and then finally, we want to go. Uh, we want to get out and rate services that have been registered with us, but have yet uh, to be rated. So those are our priorities from March uh, going forward. Um, and I, I really hope in the coming months uh, we will be able to talk to you about an increasing volume of services where we have uh, we have re-rated as well. OK, we can move on, Steph. OK, quick, quick sip of water. Right, so we're going to talk now about our changing approach to uh, regulation. And I'm going to talk through this slide. I'm going to kind of do it column uh, by column, as I think that is uh, it's the easiest way in my mind to explain how we are changing. So currently, uh, believe it or not, we have four assessment frameworks. We have one for health, one for social care, and we have two in registration. Um, and those assessment frameworks have pages of key lines of inquiry. Um, they run to about 330 uh, pages of, of questions uh, uh, that we ask and we look at on providers. So a, a massively complex um, assessment uh, framework regime. Our intention and what we've committed to uh, going forward is to have a single assessment framework. So moving from four assessment frameworks to one, and that assessment framework will be the one we use for all health and social care providers, be it a GP practice, a home care provider, uh, a shared life service, an acute hospital. Um, so a single assessment framework for our providers. But also the single assessment framework will be what we use as we take on our new powers around assuring local authorities and assuring systems. So the same assessment framework for those three layers of um, uh, assurance and regulation. So that's the first column. Second column. Uh, so prior to the pandemic, a lot of our activity was driven by previous ratings. We always responded to risk, but a lot of our activity was um, driven by previous ratings and providers would tend to have a sense of how frequently we come out, uh, depending on whether they were inadequate or outstanding to give you the, the extremes. Um, through the pandemic, we've become much, much, much more responsive. So 52% of our uh, risk based inspections are triggered by information we receive by the public, families, people who work in, in the, the, the social care sector. But our old ways of working were uh, a, a lot more kind of planned inspections based on uh, previous ratings. Um, and then a kind of set piece of we'd come out and inspect, uh, we'd rate the service and we would publish it. Our ambition uh, going forward, so if we think about what the public wants from us and what we want to do around driving improvement, is we want to move towards a much more ongoing view of assessment, a much more timely way of sharing with providers and with the public what we know about the quality and risk of services out there. So instead of moving away from these kind of set pieces where there may be an inspection every three years to a much more fluid way of updating uh, providers and the public about what we know about quality and risk. 
So let's talk about the uh, inspection changes that we will be making. So currently, uh, an inspection um, before the pandemic would often have been comprehensive. We would have gathered a huge amount of evidence across our five key lines um, of inquiry, and that information would have been accurate at that point in time. So at that point in time, on those uh, you know, hours, few days we were with that provider, that was what we found and that was accurate. Going forward, we don't want our inspection activity to just be a point in time. We want to have multiple opportunities to update what we know about the quality of care being delivered uh, in, in, a, uh, in a social care, in a setting that's delivering um, uh, social care. We want, to, um, we want to use our data and our intelligence uh, better to keep, uh, keep that updated. And when I talk about uh, data, um, your mind might just jump to numbers and Excel spreadsheets. When we talk about data and intelligence, we talk about the wealth of knowledge held by um, inspectors, held by local authorities, clinical commissioning groups, advocacy agencies. So all of that knowledge and intelligence is what we are talking about uh, when we talk about that. But also we want to, going back to that proportionate point, we absolutely will be continuing to inspect. And there are services where we want to spend more time in those settings to get a better idea of what it feels like to receive care in those um, environments. And that might look like more out of hours um, assessments, depending on uh, any concerns we might have. Um, some of you will be familiar uh, with our SOFI framework, our short obs observational framework, where we sit and we just observe a handover, a meal time, how uh, colleagues talk to the people they are supporting. So we envision uh, in certain circumstances spending more time on site, more observation, but also having a wealth of other ways of updating what we know um, around quality and risk. Moving on to the fourth column, um, how we uh, develop uh, judgments. So um, the way we've done things to date is we will line up our judgments against uh, the ratings characteristics and that what we that's what we will publish. Um, there's a huge amount of um, inspector uh, insight and uh, what they um, what they perceived to be captured in that. We want to, in our new way of um, our new methodology, be a lot clearer about what evidence is needed to satisfy uh, which uh, uh, which topic we're talking about. Um, so we want to be really clear for our inspectors and for providers about what we expect to be enough to satisfy that we have reached this judgment. Um, and in order to do that, there will be uh, the ability for us to assign scores to what we are uh, what we are judging. And the um, the thinking behind that is we have really heard you talk about um, consistency, transparency, how have you reached that judgment, what's different between that service getting that rating and that service getting an alternative rating. We want to do all we can in our new methodology to really explain our thinking in how we've reached the judgments um, that we've reached. And then the final column, um, as you know, uh, prior to the pandemic, we would uh, monitor, inspect, rate and publish uh, often quite lengthy Report, I think for many people, um, uh, people would look at a rating and they may cast their eyes over the first page or two about our findings. Um, I'm not sure how often people would read through a kind of 30 page PDF uh, report. So we want to uh, have the ability to update ratings more frequently, to publish short statements on our website, as we have been doing um, for maybe about six months now. A short statement that says we've reviewed the information we have on the service and, and there's no need for us to uh, go and inspect at this time um, and the ability to produce more succinct reports that tell the public what they need um, as a result of what we know about the service. OK, so that's a little bit of a flavour of what's going to feel different. I'm going to move on now to talk about our new assessment framework. Um, so we are we are all feeling uh, we at CQC and, and the people that have been involved with this today are feeling quite excited by this new framework and I'd be really keen to hear how this lands with you as we talk about it today. My personal excitement um, and Dave James, who will be joining us in the Q&A, is um, there has been some fantastic work done a long time ago by Think Local App Personal to develop uh, something called the Making It Real I Statements, where after massive uh, con uh, consultation co-production, they came up with a set of statements about what matters to people about the quality of care that they receive. 
Um, as I mentioned at the start of this presentation, our ambition in our strategy is to regulate through the eyes of people with lived experience. So at the top of our triangle, I'm really pleased to say that we will be keeping our five key questions. It's a, it's a way of regulating that you know, we know and the public knows, but we will be aligning those five key questions with the making it real eye statements. What matters to people when it comes to caring, safe, effective, etc. So our five key questions remain. If we go down a layer of the triangle, we are um, we are moving away from our ratings characteristics to having quality statements. And these quality statements are going to be expressed as we statements. So we as a provider of home care will. Da, da, da. And these we statements will be set at the level of good. So this is about having real clarity about what matters to people and what we expect from providers to hit the good bar when it comes to uh, what we are what we are looking for when we go out and, and when we inspect and assess uh, providers. So there will be uh, there will be uh, set quality statements um, and they will be expressed as we statements at the uh, level of good. Underneath that, we are going to be a lot clearer about what evidence we will we will collect to satisfy uh, the judgments we've reached on those quality statements. And there are six categories of evidence that we are going to look to. We're going to look for people's experience. We're going to look to information we've had back from staff and leaders. We're going to look at feedback from partners. Critically, we're going to do observation. We're going to look at policies, processes, procedures, and we're going to look at outcomes for people. So we're going to be clear about what evidence we're going to collect. And we're also going to be clear about when is enough evidence collected. So you may be a provider on the call who has experienced um, uh, possibly an inspector coming back for more and more and more information for them to uh, feel that they can conclude the judgment they've reached. We want to be really explicitly clear about when is enough enough? When have you got enough evidence to satisfy the judgments you have reached? So those three air lines in the pyramid will be the same principles we will apply for providers, for local authorities and for systems. The bottom bit of the pyramid is where we will flex a bit depending on uh, what we are looking at. So, for example, we may uh, look at different areas of, of uh, different quality indicators, different areas of evidence in a local authority uh, in comparison uh, to a um, extra care housing scheme, uh, care delivered there, for example. So um, the bottom bit of the pyramid gives us some flexibility about the data and information that we will uh, capture depending on the scope of the assessment that we are looking at. And as you'd expect, all of our methodology will be underpinned by best practice standards and guidance. So that is our, our new um, that's our new a flavour of our new assessment framework. So if we can move on, please, Steph. So I've mentioned a couple of times, and I know this isn't the main focus for this call, but um, if you are a provider of social care, I am confident you will have an interest in what our new role will be around local authorities in particular, but you might also be interested in our new role around um, integrated care systems. So the health and care bill, which is in its final stages of moving through uh, Parliament, will uh, is looking to see us taking on new powers from April 2003. Uh, 2023 to um, uh, to assure the quality of services being delivered by local authorities and by um, integrated care systems. When it comes to integrated care systems, we have already uh, been advised uh, by government about the areas of focus, which is around leadership, integration and safety and quality. When it comes to local authority um, assurance, um, this is a power we, we are very uh, enthusiastic to take on. And the reason why uh, we are, uh, multiple reasons, but if I think about the many conversations I've had with providers, one of the main things that social care providers say to me and say to uh, my team is the way that you are commissioned, the way that you're, um, you're commissioned, the, the the amount that's paid for the quality of care that you deliver significantly impacts on on what you can the support you can provide to people receiving care. So it's something I think as a sector we've been really keen to um, have a role with. Um, our role around local authority assurance is about assuring ourselves, government, the public about local authorities 
Delivery Against the Care Act Part 1. And for those of you who know the Care Act, it is, it's a huge, huge, very important bit of uh, legislation. So we've been really benefiting from working with uh, an expert advisory group of people who use services, families and stakeholders, obviously including local government and government, to hone down on what they think matters when it comes to the local authority assurance. Um, and we've got four groups, that are, are four areas of focus that will be worked up a lot more over the next 12 months. Um, one is about working with people. How do people get their needs assessed in a timely way? How many people have care eligible needs that are waiting for a, a package of care to be sourced, a placement, etc. The second one is around how local authorities provide support, so how they work with the market, how do they co-produce and design services with providers, um, how do they support people where providers have to leave uh, the market. The third bucket is around um, ensuring safety, so local authorities approach to safeguarding, um, market management, uh, contingency planning, etc. And then the final one is leadership. So I won't uh, I won't go into this in depth today. Um, we've got uh, workshops that we're holding on these two topics. So if it's an area you have a particular interest in, we would welcome you to the table um, because we're spending the next 12 months designing this. So we're ready to go live in April um, and uh, I'm confident if we get this right we can really help uh, improve outcomes for people in terms of getting access to care in a timely uh, way and showing what best practice looks like when it comes to the way local authorities work. And I suppose just one final thing, the ability we can that we can look at three layers um, is that we might go into a place and we might see a number of social care providers who aren't delivering care at the quality we would expect. And during those inspections, it might become apparent there might be a recurring theme from those for example, home care providers, that the um, hourly rate that they're being commissioned at and the way that they are being commissioned um, by, for example, a particular local authority is impacting on uh, how they are um, able to deliver high quality care. We would be able to look at that information and think, oh, do we want to go in and have a look at how the local authorities are doing uh, commissioning and market shaping? We could go in and look at the local authority and find uh, whatever we may find, but actually that may uncover that there are challenges in the relationship between the local authority and health leaders and how that collective money is being spent and how um, how they are collectively looking at the needs of that population, which would enable us to look at go in and look at the um, integrated care systems. And there are many different versions of those uh, of of that um, escalation I've described, but the fact that we with our same assessment framework about what matters to people can look at those different layers is um, is something I hope you will uh, feel uh, positive about as well. Right, I'll move on. OK, so um, things such as our assessment framework, our approach around local authorities and integrated care systems, we are benefiting hugely from having such a fabulously engaged sector who regularly tell us where we could do better, uh, when we're getting things right and how things need to look different. So this slide just gives you a flavour of the numbers of people who have been involved to date uh, with um, uh, with the method, with our approach and how that's shaping up. Um, and at the end, I'll remind you um, if this has whetted your appetite and you want to get more involved how you can do so as well. So if we can move on. So just a couple of other things before I pause at the corner of my, my eye, I can see your questions coming in thick and fast. So uh, we need to make sure we've got ample time for that. Um, We've talked about our strategy, we've talked about our priorities and our new assessment framework. I just want to flag to you a couple of other things that may um, may not be in the forefront of your mind. So prior to the pandemic, we produced two really important um, publications that I would love you to uh, refresh yourself with um, if, if it's, um, you know, obviously a huge amount has happened in the last two years. The first one is our, our, our report into um, oral health of people in care homes uh, called Smiling Matters, where um, uh, I'll cut to the chase, uh, where we, uh, we didn't find consistently residents having uh, up-to-date oral health care plans, access to dentists, and sometimes even the basics such as, uh, you know, a toothbrush uh, to ensure that their, their teeth are kept clean. And all of the uh, physical implications associated with poor oral health uh, were drawn out during that. So we uh, shared that publication and um, uh, we are looking at focusing in on oral health in our up and coming inspection. So just a little reminder, um, maybe dust that off your shelf or click on the link and have a little look at oral health. And then the other really important publication we shared prior to the pandemic was um, we looked at issues around supporting individuals to have uh, 
relationships, their sexuality recognised. Um, and in that report, we reflected that uh, and what you often find in, as you'd expect in, in the social care sector, is it reflects what happens in wider society, which is generally uh, we as a society maybe aren't as comfortable as we could do with being about having conversations about sex, sexuality and relationships. And our report found um, people working in the social care sector um, didn't feel that they had this, always had the skills and the training and the confidence to broach what can be sensitive topics around uh, sexuality. And the report draws out best practice, but it also shows um, how things can go very badly wrong for people when um, those need, when there isn't adequate kind of planning and support around those aspects of people's lives. And we all know uh, that a high quality person centred care is holistic uh, and includes all aspects of uh, the lives that you and I lead. And we need to make sure we uh, obviously su support and focus on that when it comes to people receiving social care as well. So just a little flag on that. And I think I've got a couple of wrapping up slides and then we will get to questions. So um, we've got a huge amount of transformation we're doing as an organisation. We're changing the way we regulate. We're also changing the way we are organising ourselves um, with our operational teams. So in order to deliver our ambition to uh, effectively regulate systems um, and to not just look at providers in isolation, but to look at how people move between providers, um, we are uh, moving our inspectors into what we're calling multidisciplinary teams, where you would have an adult social care inspector still inspecting adult social care services, but working closely with a primary medical services inspector who might inspect a GP practice and a hospital inspector who might inspect a hospital. And then that team of people can also, as well as using their sector specialisms to inspect those respective service areas, they can look at how people move between services as well. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of testing um, through uh, April through to March about our new methodology um, and we will uh, continue to learn and uh, adapt that uh, based on what we hear as well. Um, if we can move on, Steph, I think next one. So um, you'll probably be aware of this. We have our blogs, we have our uh, Twitter pages, we have our Citizens Lab, which is our um, digital way of people engaging in uh, things that we are consulting on. Um, and we have our podcast series. So lots and lots of ways to, to get in touch and keep up to date.